I'm Harriet Bart. I'm an artist. I've been working for about 50 years in the field of art. I do studio art, public art, exhibitions. Um, I create artist books for, for museums and special libraries. I do a lot of different kinds of work. There's a very big difference between studio art and public art. When you're working with public art, there's special challenges. There's always a committee. So you're dealing with groups of people, you're dealing with communities, you're greeting, you're dealing with um, guidelines, ADA guidelines, safety guidelines, guidelines that um, using materials that can be cleaned. It depends how long the piece is meant to be uh, in its particular site. In the studio, you close the door and you do whatever you feel like. Uh, I always made things, but I didn't really think about being an artist. Some of that is the era in which I came of age. I did not have any women role models. Um, in 1976, a group of women coalesced in Minneapolis to form a women's collective. It was called WARM, W-A-R-M, which stood for the Women's Art Registry of Minnesota. We opened a gallery, beautiful gallery, in the Warehouse District of Minneapolis, and I became a member. And I had community. For the first time, I had the community of, of other women artists. And together, there was a lot of power, a lot of energy, and we did amazing things. We had exhibitions, we got grants, we invited visiting artists from New York, from California. Um, and that's when I got my first studio outside of my home. I was working as a studio artist. I, my training, my background training, my formal training is in contemporary fibers, which gave me a good background for working with materials, for using my hands. Um, and my first exhibition, a solo exhibition, was at the Warm Gallery in 1978. In the beginning of the early 80s, I moved away from textiles, still into very tactile media, but I moved into more conceptual art and I began working with books as objects and as uh, cultural icons, um, conceptual objects. And I started painting them, covering them so that they looked like stone. And I started building with them. As a woman, I could build large sculptures, one unit at a time. I could do it totally by myself. I could take them apart, pack them in my car, move them on down the road, but they were temporary. They would not endure uh, the elements. About that time, I can't remember, sometime in the 80s, there was uh, a competition for a public art piece in Ibaraki, Japan. Ibaraki, Japan was a sister city to Minneapolis. And I thought, hmm, these structures that I've been building out of books, very architectural, large scale, might work. So I entered the competition with absolutely no expectations. It was a large commission and I won. And a short time after that, I wound up going to Japan for three days, just three days, to see the, the site where the work would be. When I got to the site, it was really still a construction zone. There was no building. There's a yellow X on the ground where the sculpture was gonna go with not much more information. So I came back to my studio and I had, as I said, I had a good budget to work with. So I figured out how to translate this project into bronze. So it turned out to be um, something that is, um, it's, it's almost circular in shape, but probably as tall as I am and maybe seven and a half feet in diameter. And it was constructed of bronze books. And that was the beginning. And I figured if I could do that, I could do just about anything. And also once I did that and there was um, information out, images of the work, I began to have other opportunities. And I did other large scale bronze works. I did work in, in glass. Um, but most often I worked in bronze. You figure it out. I really wanted to do it. I, would, I had been building these large shapes and these large structures that were very, as I said, very architectural. And I wanted a way to make them 
even more so, more permanent. And this is a perfect opportunity. You have to take a chance. And much of the time, I mean, since that was kind of an accident that I, I won this competition with no experience, first time out. Um, it didn't always go that smoothly. There were other things I applied for and I did not get. You have to be persistent. It's hard not to take it personally, but you just keep on moving. I, didn't, I did not go to graduate school. I had, had an undergraduate degree. I didn't have an MFA. In those days, it was difficult to do. But we taught each other. We learned from each other. It was an incredible opportunity. Some women had more experience than others. Uh, we shared um, experience. We sh shared knowledge. We had somebody to talk to about our ideas, and we were encouraged. We, was, they, we were very brave at that time. And it was also a time of great political action. So we were a very political group. It was indeed a feminist organization and all that that would imply in the 70s. Um, but I think that bringing people in from the outside was very helpful. So I think having support, I think to be alone without support, not in community with other like-minded artists is very difficult. Studio art is pretty isolating, but I think if you have a community of peers that you trust and you're open to criticism, suggestion, uh, work gets stronger. Uh, so I, I personally really, uh, I like my time alone. Uh, I'm used to working alone, but I work within a community. My studio now, I'm in a building with 23 other artists. Uh, there are a lot of commercial businesses in that building. But the artists are really, um, we cross many uh, age, age span and media. But if I'm not sure what I'm doing or I don't know how to do something, I can always call on someone whose studio is nearby and just say, I need your eye, or can you help me move this, or what do you think? Um, and that's valuable, really valuable. I think that, in my experience, many artists are introverts. So it's, we, we like to work alone, we're used to being alone, but it's really important to surround yourself with, doesn't need to be a large group, but a small group of people that you trust. I did a public art project for the Weissman Art Museum at the University of Minnesota. And I can't remember, and for them, I designed and built uh, out, of, out of wood, a cross between a Shinto shrine and a 17th century Scandinavian corn crib. And we got students involved and we filled it with books. Um, and on the side of the building, we had a big sign in yellow that said cultivate. And this is a beautiful Frank Gehry building. And at the base of the building, uh, the uh, Gopher Crop and Soils Club planted, planted corn. And I wanted that to span that conceptual space between cultivating the land and cultivating the mind because the University of Minnesota land-grant institution based in agriculture. So I had this very beautiful, elegant form. Students were involved um, bringing books to fill it. Students were involved planting corn. Um, and I think it was a very successful project. And I'm wondering if if Lynette saw that. And I'm wondering if that's how uh, it came to Iowa. That would be my best guess. So then that's the other thing that happens. Your public artist is out there and somebody sees it and says, ah, oh, this is, looks like an interesting artist. Um, send me some information. Um, I think that I was approached, <clears throat> even then you do proposals and maybe you'd make more than one proposal and then you get feedback from the committee and a decision is made. Sometimes you initiate something yourself that you don't have any idea of where it's going to go. I have a friend, a collaborator, artist, who lives in Boston. Her name is Yuwen Wu. Yuwen and I met in 2010 at um, artist residency in Virginia. That's another thing that I would encourage people to do to apply for residencies. So we met and our work was very um, compatible. I admired her work, she admired my work, and we began to talk about the things that we cared about. <clears throat> we were invited 
to uh, present some work at the M, the Minnesota Museum of American Art in St. Paul, as a project space. And we had applied for it. I had talked with the director and I said, Yuan and I want to work together. We want to see if our work is compatible. Is there ever a time when the museum has an opening, even just for a short period of time, so we can put work together and see if it works? And she said, well, how about five weeks? So we had five weeks together to really not only cement our friendship, but to cement our way of working and the fact that we could work well together. Um, <clears throat> so over time, uh, we after that, we were invited to do an exhibition at Carleton College in um, Northfield. They were doing a campus-wide project on the subject of walking. And Yuen and I were invited to do their museum and to present something. And we became very interested in the forced displacement, global displacement of refugees forced for either war or environmental issues, having to leave their country and always on the move. And at that time, there was something like 6.5 million people globally displaced. So we did an entire installation on the subject of walking and, <clears throat> and global displacement. After that, um, we started talking about working directly with refugee women. And we tried to think about how to do that. And I contacted um, my daughter, who works for the Minnesota Humanities Center and works with diversity programming, and asked her if she could help me get in touch <clears throat> with a community that might be interested in this project. And she put me in touch with uh, someone in the Somali community. And I talked with her, and we began to meet with women, Somali women, in small groups. And the purpose of this was to gather, to tell stories, <clears throat> and to make bundles. So Yuen and I made bundle forms, um, and we collected fabric from, really, from all over the world. We brought everything to these workshops that we did and asked women to make bundles and to tell us their stories, to write the story on the bundle, if they would, otherwise just to talk to us about their stories. Even then, it's complicated. At first, we thought we would have women make bundles and they would bring something important that they cared about that would be in the bundle. And then we realized for security reasons, we can no longer do that, that UN and I would have to make all the bundles. And they were all made out of polyfill, like you might make teddy bears. And uh, we would make them. And then we could not let the women make the bundles at home. They had to be made in our presence. They could not leave the studio. And doing this with a variety of communities in Minneapolis, we worked with the Hmong, we worked with the Somali, um, we, in Boston, we worked a lot with Asian communities. We went to um, Arizona and New Mexico, and we worked with a lot of Hispanic women, women from Afghanistan, women from Iran and from Iraq. And we probably created maybe a thousand bundles. The project was exhibited at Site Santa Fe. And that again was a <clears throat> total fluke, apply for grants. I had gotten a grant. And this wonderful grant that I had brought curators from other places to my studio to look at what I was doing and to critique and to have a conversation. And the woman who came to, one of the women, one of the curators who came to my studio was Irene Hoffman, who was at that time the director of Site Santa Fe. She asked about that project, which was sort of over in the corner. And I told her about it. And she said, let me get back to you. And then she invited us to have a major presentation of this work. So it was public art. Um, unfortunately, it was self-funded. We didn't get a grant to do it. Uh, it was great for public exposure. Uh, it was very important to us because it was something we felt and cared deeply about. Um, and it was exhibited, but it was very difficult. And COVID kind of put an end to the project. So it's. I probably have 500 bundles in my studio that I don't know what to do with. But it was um, another form of public art that was very meaningful to us. It was a very heartfelt, and it's quite beautiful, but it's not something that we were able to get a grant for. So sometimes you just put it out there and at your own expense. But it, it fulfills a need that you have to reach out to various communities.
Well, I can only speak to my own experience, but I think for emerging artists, collectives and communities are terrific. And sometimes they're artists run galleries. So Warm was a women's collective. We ran that gallery. We installed the shows, we washed the floors, we <clears throat> did everything that needed to be done. We also published a magazine because no one was reviewing women's work. And as I said before, we had uh, speakers come in and talk to us. Um, we made the opportunities. You don't start out getting a gallery. The first thing you need is a body of work. So don't forget about that. That's the most important thing. You put yourself in your studio, you stay there, you develop a body of work that you feel good about and that says what you want to say. Have some people in to see it. Maybe you approach um, other collectives, other groups of artists who do run a gallery. Sometimes you're lucky and you get picked up by a um, commercial gallery right away. That was not my experience. I started at Warm. I think uh, sometimes universities are interested in work. I think there's a lot of interest now in young artists who are doing things that are based in community and based in public art and based in the political issues of the day. I'm seeing much more activist art of a different nature now. But nothing matters if you're not making the work, if you're not trying to make the very best work that you can make, if you're not self-critical, uh, if you can't speak to what your work is about, that first and foremost is important. And then you can't be too shy and you can't be afraid of rejection. I have a file full of rejection letters and I saved them all. And every once in a while when my children were growing up, I would show them to them and say, this is what happens. And you can either quit or you just keep going. And if you believe in what you do and you have passion for it and you want to do it, you just keep doing it. And if things are not working out, you might seek some advice. There might be some help for you along the way, uh, but just keep going. In 2020, very bad timing, in January of 2020, I had a retrospective exhibition at the Weissman Art Museum. That was, it opened January 31st. COVID, it was the beginning of COVID. But I had a retrospective and I think that Lynette must have seen it and was very interested. And because I had done public art on this campus before, um, I don't know if she suggested it to, to Sydney, but I suspect it was from Lynette knowing my work over time. She'd kind of followed it and having done work on the campus. And this museum, I think, presents the work of artists who work in public art. Um, and I was in, invited. So it was an invitation. Um, most of the time now, when I have an exhibition, it's invitational. I don't have to send out quite as many proposals. I remember as a young artist sending out a dozen proposals to different uh, university galleries, different um, art galleries, to have them look at my work. Every once in a while, something would happen. Somebody would be interested in it. But you do get a lot of rejection to just keep going. So this one came about through the retrospective at the Weissman Art Museum. The dark walls here, it's the paint exactly that was used in the retrospective. Not all of the work from that exhibition is here. Uh, some of this work is part of other exhibitions. Reckoning, which is behind me, the installation, uh, was created in 2022. That's the newest work. The black ascension cape that you see above the table, that's from 1975 or six. So this is what I would call a survey show. Most of the artists I know have in the past done other things. Now I'm with a group of people and we just do studio art. But generally teaching is the path. I've done some teaching, um, but I've been also fortunate in receiving grants. Grants are very important. But many of the artists I know have other jobs or have had other jobs. I think that there are more opportunities to sell art now than when I was a coming of age as an artist. And I can't say that I sell very much art. My art is not easy to hang above a sofa. And it depends what people are looking for. One of the things I'm seeing on websites is that artists are also offering merchandise. I think that's a great idea. But however it is, you're gonna piece it together. You're gonna to piece it together with a family that might help you or a job that pays something to you or a lot of servers, 
lot of servers are creative, um, and uh, grants. My books are, are um, very limited edition books, and I do have most, most of the work that I place has to do with my books. So maybe it's an edition of 15. Most I've ever done is an edition of 50. And there are libraries that have special collections, some private collections. The world of artist books is very small. And there I probably have 20 people who care about what I do. But it's really the books that allow me to do a lot of other things. I would stress the importance of community for artists. And the other thing that, depending on your life and the challenges that you face, you might need to leave your smaller community to go to a larger community where there's more opportunities, where there are more artists. You have to be brave. You have to ask for things. Be willing to face rejection. Try again. Meet people. I mean, when you start meeting other artists who are your colleagues, and your friends, they share opportunities as well. I think it's really important to be generous, generous with other artists, generous with young artists, and pass that along.